Hi, this is Ronald Johnson, your life coach, mentor coach. And what I do is I help people that are tired of who they are and where they are in life. And this is Gloria, your life coach. I help those who are feeling stuck, struggling with difficulties such as self-doubt, inner judgment, lack of confidence, life transitions, and taking steps forward. And welcome to Life's A Shuffle podcast. Now, you may wonder why it's called Life's A Shuffle. And the reason why we came up with this title was that life is really shuffling. And it doesn't matter where you come from, your background, what age you are, you're shuffling multiple things in life. And the best thing to know in life is everybody faces your struggles and everybody faces what you're going through. But there's hope in learning something about that. So when our guests share their journey, the hope is you learn something in that journey so yourself can navigate the struggles you face, the low self-esteem, the self-confidence. And that's why we call podcast Life's a Shuffle. And throughout this podcast, we share our personal overcoming stories, as well as our guests who shares their personal journey in overcoming their personal struggles. Life's a Shuffle podcast is here to connect like-minded individuals. And thank you for listening to Life's a Shuffle podcast. Hi, this is Gloria, Mindfulness Coach. Welcome to another episode of Life's a Shuffle. This is Ron Johnson, your Mindfulness Coach and Life Coach. And welcome to another episode of Life's a Shuffle. And we have a special guest. And what I like about this special guest, it's um, around the world. Uh, you know, the world is huge and everybody out there is connected. It doesn't matter if you're from Antarctica and, and you're from North America. You are connected in some way, some form, some fashion. And all of us contribute to the overall, I would call it the collective or society to make things better. So we have a special guest all the way from the Philippines. Frida Sorensen, thank you and welcome to Life's a Shuffle podcast. Woo, my home country. Welcome, Frida. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ron and Gloria. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Yeah. So, Frida, tell us, um, tell us about yourself, um, what you do, who you are. Um, I, I'm just, I'm so excited to finally have someone from my home country. Um, so yes, please share. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gloria. Um, yes, I'm also super excited to be interviewed by, by someone from the Philippines. We have, um, a really great connection in our, you know, in our love for, for mindfulness and meditation and, you know, pride in our, in our country and where we're coming from. So, yeah, thank you so much for, for hearing my story. Um, as Ron mentioned, I'm currently based in the Philippines. I say currently because I've lived in a lot of different countries over my life. Um, I was actually born in Denmark to a Danish father and a Filipina mother. Uh, very early on, I was just a baby. My parents decided to move back to the Philippines. My Mother really wanted to raise her family within, you know, within her culture, with her family being around and, and her family rooted in, you know, in, in her heritage. So uh, I was here for, I lived here for 13 years. I went through school here. I was raised by, by a lot of family members. And I also you know, even with my, my father being so far away from home, he actually was able to, to also still instill his language and his values um, onto us. I have a, have a younger brother as well. Um, so going to the local school here in our, our village is called Davila, uh, we're at the very top of, um, of Luzon, which is the, the biggest island, the main island of the Philippines. We're about 500 kilometers from Manila. So it's very rural. And 30 years ago, you know, it was even more, more rural. 30 plus years ago, it was more rural. So I went to the local school in Davila um, and, you know, just grew up amongst locals. And on the weekends, my father would homeschool us in the Danish curriculum. 
Yeah. <laughs> so I, I was reflecting on this a couple of uh, just a couple of days ago in my journaling. And I'm like, hang on, I don't remember a lot of summer holidays. And that's because and weekends for that matter. So I was homeschooled on the weekend. And then a lot of the summers of my childhood, we would actually go back to Denmark and I would slot right into the to the Danish curriculum. And I would just continue on, you know, the, I'd have summer holidays here, we'd go over there and I would just slot right back into the Danish curriculum or the Danish school system. And then I'd come back to, to the Philippines when the school year started here and go back to school, you know, so it was, it was a lot of, <laughs> there was a lot of schooling. Um, but it, you know, it taught me a lot of things about re- resilience and about adaptability. Uh, and I'm really proud to say that you know, I have a Danish and a Filipino heritage and I connect with them very much. Um, and then after, it took a while. So I think I was I was doing my school here for six years and my parents realized that it's very hard to continue to homeschool a teenager. So they decided that it was time to, to go back to, to Denmark and reconnect with the Danish side of the family. So we moved back at the, you know, at the age of 13, I think I was, um, and I slotted right back into the, to the school system there. And there was, again, a lot of adaptability needed to happen, you know, because I was, I felt I was Filipino and I was taken out of my, my comfort zone. Um, the Filipino values are very much around community and family and, you know, the, the Western culture, the American, Australian, European culture is very much about individuality. And that was something that I hadn't really, you know, it wasn't really super important in, in the Philippines to be an individual and having your own opinion. So I struggled with that. I struggled to find my voice. Um, but I had the resilience, you know, I had the resilience that I'd um, picked up from from living in the Philippines. And that experience really, you know, it gave me a a deep sense of, of appreciation for multiculturalism. I was really proud of the the languages that I had. I was really proud of my Filipino heritage. And I think the, the one thing I took away from my childhood was that I had seen what poverty was like in the Philippines, and I had also seen what it was like for people to have plenty. Mm-hmm. So I'd, I'd seen, you know, I'd, I'd only have to walk outside my backyard in the Philippines and be able to see the difference between me and someone, you know, coming from a different family who don't have, the, you know, enough resources for their kids to go to school or even just enough resources to provide for the, for the basic needs. And then to be be taken out of that society and then going into into a Western, you know, into a Western culture and then seeing that there is there are people who have plenty and there are people who don't. And we're not created equally, you know, where people need help and we need to we need help we need to help each other so that we can disperse the resources more equally. And I understood that from a really, really young age, like I would see being in the classroom in my, you know, provincial school here in in the Philippines, you would see that there are children, the children that are more disruptive or that have lower grades or that are always being caught doing naughty things. They were consistently also the children who, who were coming from lower socioeconomic families. Like I understood this as a child very early on. I didn't understand so much what the differences were. I just knew that I had more and they they didn't have. And that's why they were acting up in the in the classrooms. So this kind of value I took on into my into my adulthood. So um true to my family heritage, I ended up going to Australia when I was 19 and I finished my university degree there. I did psychology and then I finished a counseling degree and I went into the world of youth work. So my first 
job was working with a, a nonprofit, working with youth at risk. So young people with mental health issues, young people coming from, you know, intergenerational trauma, intergenerational unemployment, uh, young people who uh, were, you know, homeless. Um, and, you know, I see now that my my background from, from childhood up until that point, it's been leading me to that point too, because, you know, I really, I understood the the suffering of young people and, and growing up uh, without the resources that they needed to to flourish, you know, as young people, because I'd seen that um, not so much for myself, but I'd seen it in my environment from a very early age. And then from there, going on with my career as a, as a social worker, I started to experience a lot of difficulties. Uh, I realized that I didn't have the resilience to the inner resilience to cope with may maybe a lot of the, the work pressure that I was experiencing. You're working with highly vulnerable young people and, you know, you're needing to set really clear boundaries. You're needing to be able to have the skills to ask for help. Um, and a lot of the times when you're young, um, you, you just see that everybody else knows what they're doing. And you don't want to ask for help, right? So I was I was sort of doing this job. Um, maybe the first couple of years in social work, I was going, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm just going to keep going because everybody else seems to know what they're doing. And I got to a point where I was just so stressed out every single day, like I was, um, you know, dealing with anxiety every day. And... I realized that I needed to to figure out how to to develop this inner resilience. You know, like if I want to do this work for the next two decades, how am I going to make sure that I'm still going to be there? Because the the number, the you know, the percentage of of burnout in social work and in the helping profession is in, is huge. So that's when I started going out and trying, you know, trying to find practices that would support me building that. I mean, I'd done psychology at school, so I knew I had to start there. And then I discovered, um, you know, yoga psychology. I discovered mindfulness and meditation and that they, that they were really effective practices. You know, it, it, it's a process when you start to heal yourself or you start to bring in these practices, you know, it's not just going to be stress be gone <laughs> or anxiety be gone, but it's a process of, of doing the practice every single day, or it's a, it's a dedication to going to yoga two or three times a week. Um, and being of service to yourself in that way, it's a process of wanting to sit down and write about your difficult experiences. So those, um, I spent nearly 10 years in the social work industry, and it was all about that. It was about, you know, dealing with the work and being as supportive as possible to my clients as well as to my uh, social work colleagues, and then privately doing the inner work going to yoga class, doing meditation, reading about it. Um, my very first meditation book was, um, was Eckhart Tolle, The Power of Now, which was the first time I was introduced to mindfulness, actually. And I really recommend that, that as, um, as a first book, if you, really, if you are curious about what mindfulness is about and how it can help you, um, The Power of Now is, yeah, is super, super helpful and insightful. From there, I actually discovered my real passion, and that was to help others cope with the difficulties that they're facing in life. So I was experiencing a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety. I'm super grateful that I didn't burn out, and I think I really think that that's because I had these practices in place. Um, but after that, I thought this is there's something really powerful here, like. It's something that our society don't teach us to do. There is no curriculum when you go to school in 
you know, how to develop healthy relationships, how to communicate effectively, how to problem solve, um, how to self-regulate. There's nothing, you know, how to look after yourself in a holistic way through exercise and diet and um, mentally and emotionally. We don't learn these skills. So I thought it was really important to go out and, and share these, these skills with um you know, to, to start with, it was actually my colleagues in social work. I, um, I started doing mindfulness sessions with, with my colleagues to start with. And I ran a camp for, for young people. The theme was mindfulness. Um, but I wanted more. I wanted to, to, uh, to, you know, to go bigger and to help more people. So I actually came full circle. I it was also a time in my life where I really wanted to go back to. I was in Australia at this time, so I really wanted to go back to to the Philippines and reconnect with my roots. Interestingly enough, very same age as my mother was when she brought me back as a baby. Um, I I came back to my family home with my partner, and. I started re-educating myself, so I became a mindfulness and meditation teacher. I tried to teach meditation, pure meditation in my community when I first came here, and it wasn't very known at all. So I was asked to teach yoga instead, uh, which I did. <laughs> so I, um, I started teaching yoga. I'd done yoga for, for maybe 10 years. I'd never taught it, but I knew what it felt like in my body. I knew the benefits that it had given me. And I knew that with my, you know, with my counseling and my social work background, I, I knew that I could guide people to, to explore themselves in the same way I had through my yoga practice. So I started very small, just teaching a couple of people, and then I ended up uh, actually partnering with a dance studio in the city. So we set up the first little yoga school in our province, and you know it was very a very gradual, a uh, very gradual spread of the word. You know, um, people knew that there was a crazy person out there teaching <laughs> yoga, something called yoga. <laughs> And I would get all these messages from people um, going, hey, well, can I join? Um, or I've heard about this, you know, my daughter is in Manila and she's doing yoga and can I join, you know? So it's, it's sort of very, very, very slowly built from there. Um, so, so since I arrived here, I've been here for three and a half years. I've done lots of things in wellness uh, with the community, um, I get requests from organizations that want to, you know, they, they want to have, um, they want to teach their staff about well-being uh, or their, you know, their staff are stressed, especially during this pandemic. So they, you know, they want to know about wellness. Um, and Gloria, you, you know, coming from the Philippines, you might know this, that there's holistic well-being is a fairly new industry so before it's always been very you know deal with the illness when it gets here as opposed to being preventative um and it's amazing you know like our the medical system has obviously evolved a lot since i grew you know since when i was here well, since um, even when I was there, much yeah, younger than you. Right. <laughs> yeah, from the 80s, right? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, our medical system is is so, um, yeah, it's very well developed, but there's still very little support around um, the more holistic, so mental and emotional health and how that impacts our long-term physical well-being is something that's fairly unknown um, here at, at this at the point at this moment. Um, but after the uh, during the pandemic, actually, people have started talking a lot about stress. They're feeling it. They're sitting at home and potentially not able to ignore it as much as when we could move around and you know we can we could distract ourselves a lot more. 
So I've um in in the last in the last year I started working with um with women actually around mental health. And that's been a super interesting journey for me actually um working with Filipino women who are running businesses, who are the breadwinners of their family, but at the same time they are still you know, needing to support their families and maybe doing that in the same way that they they want to do that in the same way that they were doing before they started working, which is to give everything. It's to, you know, they, they need to be doing everything themselves. They're raising the kids, they're cleaning, they're cooking, and also running businesses and being the breadwinners. So it's it's a really interesting space to be in. Um, and seeing how we need to develop, actually, you know, if a Filipino women want to be in this space, and I'm, you know, obviously not just talking about Filipino women, but because we're so used to giving everything and saying yes to everything, we're also just burning ourselves out. And again, that's not just about Filipino women, but you know we're we're seeing um people burning out all over all over the country all over the globe um and it's really interesting to be teaching this as i am also experiencing and having to overcome some of these barriers so one of the things i discovered when i started coaching um women in my community was that we're not very good at boundaries for example we're not very good at saying no and that it sort of reflected back at me and i realized with all my all my meditation and my practices i was not very good at boundaries um so having to learn to to overcome these or use the experience as a way to transcend or to uh, to break through the upper limit you know the things that are stopping us i also have to learn these things as well as try to teach them to others or as well as guide other people to to work through this stuff so so this is the very interesting space that i am in now and it's um it's really in inspiring to be to be working with you know my fella fella fellow filipino um business owners entrepreneurs women leaders and and as as i develop i'm helping them develop you know so um so so that's where you find me <laughs> at this point in time and who knows what's going to happen from here as you've seen my story has evolved from starting in one country and then ending up in the same space um but yeah so, so that's a little snapshot <laughs> of what's going on for me. <laughs> well, I love that story, Frida. It's a very inspiring story. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I loved it too. And I like how um, I've done a lot of extensive study on psychology. I'm going back to school, so I get a master's in psychology. But you hit on a lot of factors that um, you didn't know then but know now, you know, identity, social identity, your, mm-hmm. your powerful identity, your identity with culture, uh, ethnicity, religion, all these identities. And sometimes when you're faced with, say, so many different identities, it's hard to figure out which one resonates with you the best or which one you need to fit in. So you mm-hmm. are ping ponging back and forth between, okay, I don't fit in with this group. I don't fit in this group. Uh, I may have more money than they do, so they don't like me. So I should be, I wish I was poor. Because I, I would fit in more. We, we don't understand these. And listen to your, your evolution of how you got, got to learn this and how it evolved you into who you are today. That's so wonderful. Um, you know, these skills, I think, are life skills. And um, when you think about school, I don't know about in the Philippines, but in America, mm-hmm. it's all about doing. So you go to school, so you get education, so you get a good job. That's pretty much the basic fundamentals. But then, you know, when I work with clients that are high performance, I fix and burn out. Most of them are really well educated, work at good jobs, but they still feel unfulfilled. 
because they're not taught these life skills. See, see, they, ident they identify it with doing, which is go to school, go to great college, get your master's, get a, get a good tech job or get a good job somewhere. And there you go. You're set. You're finished. Most time, once that's done, it's like I got to end the road. So what's next? Yeah. And, um, and Frida, I'm going to reflect back to when your parents and most especially your mom who had made the decision to bring you back to the Philippines and live there for, you know, many years as you were sort of raised in the Philippines. I think one, I believe one purpose for that is for you to see how you could be, how fortunate you could be living in another country, whereas living in the Philippines as a child or as a kid, um, because you touched base on, you've seen poverty and you've seen those who has a lot more. In the Philippines, it's either you're poor or you're what they call rich. There's no one in the middle. There's no middle class. And, yeah. you know, with that, you be growing up around that. Look, look, look at you. Just look at where you're at now and, you know, how you've grown to become a social worker and just being around people who just helping, helping the youth and now helping others. Mm. Yeah, I sorry. <laughs> I <laughs> done that a second. Yeah, I think you know it it makes so much sense. Um there is there's definitely always been the understanding having seen that as a young as a young person as a child that because I have more I also have a a responsibility to give more to to use you know the education that i had access to and actually share that with with other people who wouldn't have access to this kind of you know the, this kind of teachings because yeah as as ron said it you know we we are taught just to be doing 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 um you get an education and you get a good job and you get the things <laughs> right and right. that's it's very much the same thing still here in terms of um, as evolving from, you know, from rising yourself from a place where you're, you're poor or you're poorer than your neighbor and then um, getting to a place of affluence. We are still following the Western model of, um, you know, and, and obviously it's so, it is important. Education is complete. So, so important to, to, rise out of poverty but it is about going to a good school doing doing everything getting the the education then getting into a job doing 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 and then getting the things getting the house getting the car getting the big parties um, getting all the takeaway food um, and then but then we are still once we get to that place there is still a questioning you know there will still be are do we are we capable of um of facing challenges that come up unexpectedly like this pandemic are we capable of supporting our children emotionally spiritually physically um how how is our health you know how is our long-term health and are we going to live a full long life do we have healthy practices in place in our life so there is a lot more to developing ourselves as a human being than just getting the education, doing the job, and then getting the stuff. Mm. Yeah. And, and these are the things that are not being taught to us. We're not being taught to be aware of our mental health. Mm. You know, maybe sometimes our physical health, right? Okay, you need to exercise or you need to watch what you eat because you need to stay healthy physically. Yeah. But let's talk about our mental health. Yeah. And that's the one thing that I think a lot of a lot of people lacks on is talking about it and touching on that is what's important. I agree to that. Afrida, I have a question for you. Mm. Do you believe that in our society we ask enough questions? No. <laughs> no, I certainly don't. <laughs> uh, because I was, you know, yeah. I was, I was going to say, what questions do you think are missing? Hmm. It, 
many, many. It depends on it depends on what areas of life um, that we're talking about. You know, like as as children, I think we don't we haven't um, we get shut down to ask the question why very often or very early on in our life, and actually. You know, we we were born um, as innately curious beings, and that's why your two year old toddler does cannot get enough of the of the the word why, because we're innately wanting to know about how life works. We are innately wanting to learn new things. We're innately wanting to grow, to run when we haven't even learned to crawl yet. It's inbuilt in us, but Unfortunately, very early on, we've learned to we've we've learned to um, to stay quiet. You know, unless you're innately a person who who has that skill innately that they just want. You know, that they have something to to share and they just do it. Um, so that's in terms of, of of childhood. But there's a lot of things about our society, the way things work, the way our government works, the way where way our health system works, um, why resources are being placed in this area, but not in this area that is just completely underfunded and needed, you know, especially coming from a social work background. Um, so there, there's so many questions. That's, that's our system, you know, but do we ask questions of our, in our relationships? you know what, what as opposed to um we are simply trying to read people's minds you know why aren't we asking each other more questions about how we're feeling about what it is that we want about how we can help so yeah ron i think there's a lot of questions that we need to ask and we need to be teaching future generations to be inquisitive, to go back to our natural nature of being inquisitive about life and how we can do things better, how we can evolve in consciousness, not just in technology. How can we evolve in consciousness? Um, yeah. You know, you're certainly right about that. Um, you know, in, inside of we do two things. We create mind reads and we create complex equivalents, which are two mm. things that we do all the time. So obviously in mind reads that we tend to think what someone else is thinking without asking questions. Mm-hmm. Or assuming. Con- in that exactly. Case, yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a mind read. Right. A complex equivalent is we use a parameter of, of certain things that equal X. Let's give this one. This is probably not the best example, but... Um, if someone is a uh, Hispanic background and they grew in Mexico, right? So obviously Hispanic background, they grew in Mexico. Thus, oh, they must be a farmer. Oh, they can't speak English. Mm-hmm. There's a complex equivalence, which is A equals B equals C equals D. Mm-hmm. It's a stereotype. Yeah. Exactly. Well, that's just only in that context. That was easy okay. for me to okay. describe. Okay. And con- but we do it all the time. Let's say a person has a nice house. They have a nice car. So Nice house, nice car equals, oh, they must have a good job. They must be smart. Mm-hmm. When technically we don't know if their car is leased, the home is rented, or if they're dead broke. We just don't know, right? But instead, we assume those are the equivalents. Or um, let's say um, another equivalent could be that, um, you know, the, the more, let's say social media, the more someone has followers, the more they're validated. So if someone has more more followers on their social media, thus whatever they do or say is true. Mm. So we can create all these mind reads, complex equivalents. Instead, we just don't, we don't, we're not empowering the uh, collective, which is everybody to uh, ask more questions. Like what does success mean to you? What does happiness mean to you? How do you want to live your life? How do you identify yourself? Just those simple questions will lead you in a lot of different directions, but we just don't do enough of that. And that's why I asked the question, do, are we asking enough questions to get your opinion? Because you're living in the Philippines, which is different than North America. I've never been in the Philippines. I don't know. Um, I just know based upon my experience 
is that culturally, mindfulness is not apparent in other cultures. It's just, you just do, you just do, you know, you deal with it, you suck it up, you deal with it, you suck it up. And um, that's what causes a big problem. Um, and because we continually do that, we're burning ourselves out internally because all we're doing is um, suppressing those feelings or suppressing what's happening and dealing with the, well, eventually what happens, you have stress, you have heart attacks, high blood pressure, you can't deal with society. Sometimes you have mental disorders because you just don't know how to deal with these, these pressures. And, um, you know, it's, I, I, read, I read this book called Laziness is a Lie. Mm-hmm. And um, in our society, the, the idea is that if we work, we get, we get what we need. So if we burn ourselves out, hopefully one day we get what we need when that doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was too much. If that was too much information. I apologize, but I just no. But that was that was powerful, especially yeah. the end. Yeah. When not I hear at things all, like yeah. this, yeah. When I hear things like this, is this? It feels so good to see Frida or people like you that we meet on the podcast that are um, inherently now like, wow, wait a minute, I'm waking up and say, okay, well, let's do things a little bit different. And the more people that start waking up and realize things could be different, it, it will create a more of a unity in our society versus, versus a. a um, a difference in labeling. That's what I feel mm. and believe. Yeah, I um I paused there, Ron, because I I wanted to reflect a little bit more on it because we we don't talk enough about the assumptions that we've that we've made about how we're living. You know, we're just seeing um for example, we're just seeing everybody being on social media and therefore I have to be on social media. Or, you know, if I'm not on social media, I'm missing out. My life is not full as it should be if I'm not doing the same things as other people are doing. And similarly, in terms of our work and our life and the way we've, we've chosen to structure our work and our life, we've just taken on the, the previous system which is, I mean, it's called many things, you know, it's called um, patriarchal or a more masculine way of, of, um, of doing things. And when I talk about masculine and feminine, it doesn't mean male or female, it just means an energy. It's, a, it's an energy that we have. Um, and in yoga philosophy, we talk about the masculine and the feminine and the masculine is the sun. It's the day, the active, the going out and getting your goals. It's being able to sustain energy for long periods of time. It, you know, it's super active and empowering, but at the same time, the feminine is the going inwards. It's reflection. It's um, connection to our inner nature. It's just being, without there necessarily being a goal, you know, it's just connection, it's collaboration. And having those two together are incredibly powerful, you know, so the the feminine is the moon, is this the yin and the yang as well, and, you know, in Eastern philosophy, and being able to balance these two energies is incredible, because you're able to pull out your energy when you need to get stuff done, when you need to do something you're not um, very uh, confident with, you're able to push through. And then when you, it's necessary, you pull back, you reflect You reflect on your experience, you collaborate with others because this isn't your strength, you create community. So together, the, the yin and the yang, the masculine, the feminine, the whatever you want to choose to call it, is super powerful but what we're choosing to do at the moment is just one doing one thing and it's that's a very active um do 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 way of doing things and we are not really um exploring the other side of ourselves where as human beings we need to be processing our experiences all the time in order to integrate it into who we are learn from our experiences Um, learn from the trauma, you know, that we pick up um, and then integrate it holistically into our being so that it doesn't become something that weigh us down. You know, um, my, my yoga teacher trainer, Ashley Turner, she keeps talking about that your life is your curriculum. So the things that you experience in your life, that's also where the golden nuggets are. That's also where the learning is meant to be. And that's how we then use that as food to grow, you know, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically. 
But in the the system that we have now, it's like it's all doing and fast paced, and we're burning out because we're not allowing the time that is also needed to heal ourselves, to reintegrate our learning into our being, um, step into a higher form of consciousness, um, be present to our family members or to our environment, which is an incredible, incredibly important part of life. So I I really love um, that these conversations are possible today, that we can try to imagine a different way of of being, a different way of working and living. You know what? I like how you expanded on that um, and gave us more context in, in your view. Um, it's really important that, um, you know, the meat of our life is our tra- traumatic experiences. Mm. Now, some are really severe. So I'm not talking mm. severe traumatic experiences, mm. but, you know, you hear stories like, uh, think about uh, MAD, Mothers Against Drug Driving. Um, how that really got started was a traumatic experience. It's the, the, basically, the mother that started the organization, her son, or I think daughter, was killed in a car accident by a drunk driver. She started a foundation called Mothers Against Drug Driving. I mean, there's several out there. That's the first one that came to mind that it started because of trauma. And usually when we have time or it's called cocooning or ruminating over a traumatic experience is then where we have a thing called post-traumatic growth, once we grow out of that experience to a different level. But most of us just um, don't have the resources. And I like how you use the word resources um, because it's very valuable that all of us out there have resources to get us through traumatic experiences or get us the needs we need, get us the education we need, or get us the daily needs of food, water, shelter, right? Medication, you know, healthcare. And that's really prevalent that we start championing those uh, movements because it's really, that's where life really boils down to. Um, you know, it's just really, we really, really grow is those experiences. And when I, when I think about also, when we heard what resources, as you mentioned earlier, is, you know, a lot of things in our life that we experience is because we maybe at the time didn't have the resources. So most of the time we never think or ask ourselves a question, what resources that we need to either get or learn that allows us to get our situation. Sometimes when we look at certain situations, we just think these are our resources. We have, we can't change that. And um, it becomes part of our identity and not just part of our identity it becomes part of who we are. And that's really, really to me is, you know, most people don't think about this concept. Life is really malleable and the brain is neuro, has neuroplasticity. So it can always grow, grow, learn and adapt. And just like a, a, um, a plastic mold, we can always remold ourselves if given the right resources and given the right talent. And no, we can. Most of the time we don't give our permission, our self permission enough to say, I can. Well, we don't because, you know, there's always that fear of judgment. And speaking of resources, also not very many people have or know of any resources that they have. And that's where we come in. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to my question to Frida, is what brought you back to the Philippines? And what was it about, you know, the Philippines or going back to your hometown or your family's hometown that where you wanted to be at and what do you have planned? Thanks for that question, Gloria. Um, yeah, so so what brought me back to the Philippines were a couple of things. Mainly, there, there was just an urge to, to come back and reconnect to my roots. Like with all the... Um, the self-exploration I'd done uh, working in the social work industry, I realized that I'd, I'd also spent a lot of time um, without family, like I'd spent a lot of time focusing on my career and helping other people, but I had become completely disconnected to the place where most of my values had actually come from, you know, where the values to help others had actually come from. 
so the, there was one thing there I really wanted to to reconnect. And I think I also recognize that there was a there was a hesitation to come back. Um, anyone who has lived in one place as a child and then gone off somewhere and become an adult somewhere else might know the feeling that I I haven't been an adult in this environment, right? Last time these people had a relationship with me, I was 10, for example. How am I going to now develop a relationship with these people as an adult and as as who I am now? And I think there was a lot of, there was hesitation in, in doing that. So that alone was food enough for me to go back because I didn't want to just be stuck on the other side of the world and avoiding that's that's the word I was trying to get to. I don't want, didn't want to be, be avoiding if there was a shadow there for me. Um, and then the other thing was my partner and I, um, really wanted to try a different way of life. My partner's into, uh, organic, um, farming is into um, slow living and he really wanted to get his hands um, active on a piece of land that he could develop and my fam you know we, we had that in the Philippines so it, it aligned with both our values um, that was the main thing and then it aligned very perfectly with my desire to change careers as well that I wanted to go from f- from social work and actually become a meditation teacher so lots of things just aligned that allowed us to to do to make that move. And you asked what I have planned. So at the moment I'm I'm working with with a, a few women in business and I'm actually supporting them in their leadership. Uh you know, and how they show up for, for their ventures and their businesses and their employees doing a lot of things around well-being. So I'm really hoping to expand that and really provide services that nurture Filipina CEOs so they can step into their power. Um, and at the same time, I'm develop, um, I'm, I've developed an eight-week program, coaching program for women entrepreneurs, and this is more a global project. So it's an an eight-week coaching program for women entrepreneurs who are dealing with stress, anxiety, and, um, you know, fear that their, that burnout is, is essentially going to stop them from developing their, their business and from allowing what they want to, to give into the world, you know, preventing them from, from, from putting that out into the world because of, of mental or emotional issues. So I'm doing some stuff locally and then I'm also um, developing this online coaching business of mine. Well, you know, you already know this and I've already told you this, that I love what you're doing. I love your ideas and I love the fact that you are bringing this back to a place or a country that is not known or that mindfulness or just anything that has to do with any mental health is not known in that country and you bringing that there and implementing it is i think it's wonderful and and i love that you're doing that um i think that you know it is really you're going to make a huge difference in the people in that country in the philippines and most especially we talked about women especially women i mean you all know um what women are viewed as in the Philippines, right? And I think um, just making that huge difference with the women and of course the youth, and there's a lot of them out there that has, that is not fortunate enough to have this kind of resource around them or that this is being brought into their attention at all. Maybe they're not just aware of it. So um, I love it. Mm-hmm. Love it. And um, congratulations. Thank and thank you for that. Mm-hmm. I have a question for you. Um, yeah, sure. Is is in the Philippines, in, in your context, are women more susceptible to other practices of mindfulness, meditation than men? I mean, is there separation there? I'm curious. Um, 
I would say that most of the clients I've had through my yoga practice, through my mindfulness, the stress management I've done, um, it's been mainly women, um, unless unless it's been corporate. So of course, if um, I was also doing a, um, some corporate stress management, so of course, then there's a mix um, of both men and women. Um, but the people that gravitate towards what I'm doing in the community at the moment, it's definitely majority women. Um, yeah. Do, do my, my other question then is, mm-hmm. is I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna put this question. <laughs> it's it mostly out. women. I, I know <laughs> it's, it's mostly women, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious. It's like, um, are men okay with it too? Or are they like, oh, that's different. I'm a man. I should just deal with my problems. I don't need this mm-hmm. women. I mean, what's the 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 idea behind this? I mean, that's I'm, I'm curious about. Mm. I I mean, I have to say I haven't asked um, any Filipino men. You know, not even my my family members. Mo- um, but you know, maybe even just from my own personal perspective, there is potentially a less likelihood that men are gonna admit that this is something they need um i've certainly have men um approach me about yoga from a perspective of fitness um, or curiosity but i would say that you know there. I guess from my personal experience, there there is a sense that it is harder, or may, for men to to maybe see for themselves that they could they could need the help, or maybe they don't even realize that it's something that they need. Um, as women, I think we're we're very we're innately wired towards collaboration. We're innately wired towards getting support. You know, even even as we sometimes feel like I don't want to ask for support, but I think there is an innate ability to rally people around us. So maybe, maybe it is a more, um, it's a more natural approach for a woman to go, Oh, I've heard that this is good for me. I'm going to try it. Um, does that make sense? It, it does make sense. I was asking cause, um, you know, um, in the coaching programs I've been in and things I've experienced is it's more women than men. So I'm, I'm kind of mm-hmm. curious, is this, is it America or is it around the mm-hmm. world? Mm-hmm. Um, and innately, as I was growing up, um, my dad always tell me feelings are for women mm-hmm. and I'm a man, I'm a teacher, I'm a man, not a woman. So we need to work mm-hmm. and provide for your family. And, uh, that, that, at that era had a lot of, uh, a lot of, um, just survival uh, mentality. Uh, um, let me use the word better. Lack of uh, uh, lack of abundance, more of a scarcity mentality. Mm-hmm. And usually, what people don't understand is that when you neglect an emotional part of yourself, you're actually losing a part of yourself. Mm-hmm. Because when traumatic experiences hit you and the emotions come up, right? We're human beings having a human experience, you don't deal with them. So what mm-hmm. happens when my dad had emotional problems that would, that would come up? His default was to work. Hmm. Most problems come up, default was to work. And so what was happening over the years, he would have strokes, he would have heart attack, high blood pressure, poor diet, lack of energy, you know, just all these other things because he had all these emotions he suppressed and kept so much down that now what's experienced, what you experience, what's held in your body, your mind. So what's held in your mind will experience through the body. So having poor health and all that was the fact he kept all this down. And um, mm-hmm. that's why I asked that question. I was just really, really curious about it. Yeah. You know, I would think that I think from the way out, from what I, um, what I think is that just me personally, that it could be both that they're just not aware of it or they're just, they don't want to, or they're just in denial about it. Maybe they don't want to come forward about it. You know, um, I think it's more like sometimes also that the way they grew up or in, either in their, their culture or um, the family around them, the environment that they grew up in is they're just not open-minded about it. That That's totally true. 
That's why I asked the question. I was curious. Yeah, yeah and I, I think. think yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Gloria. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I think Ron, you're bringing up such a such an important point here because I mean I'm I'm working with women and I'm I'm mainly gravitating towards that because I I have the experience that I can share with other women but I think um having support for men and what it's going to mean to be a man in the next century and in this new world that's coming up is going to be so so important because men have the right to have the resources to explore their own emotion, you know, their own emotional world, their own uh, mental world without it being labeled as one thing or another. Like we all have the, you know, the, the, the birthright, I think, to be able to explore who we are and have the resources to do so. So I've, um, I mean, I did a lot of traveling in, in um, Latin America and came across a lot of organizations who were talking to me about the, the violence in their male population, the drinking and the violence that happens. And this is not necessarily because of one, you know, because of men. It's, a, it's, a, it's the lack of support. It's the lack of the, the psychological education worldwide around how to support, you know, both men and women and everybody else. Um, so I think it's something that's going to be really interesting to see how um, the, the services that might come out to support uh, all different, all genders, you know, that, that we have. Yeah, but in particularly what you brought up, Ron, around um potentially men traditionally being taught to suppress emotions and just work. This will be an interesting space to. I would love that. Sorry, I would this, love uh, that. That's the water coming. <laughs> 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 yeah. It, it's amazing here. Like I can, I can brief every single family member, but then something will always happen. Like, fisherwoman yelling outside my window um, <laughs> yelling fish, you know uh, I can't control <laughs> that's um, okay yeah you know anyway. sometimes I, I miss that kind of um not lifestyle I mean growing <laughs> up there you know it's just and it's, I do still watch um I have the Filipino channel and I still watch it sometimes and I see that and I'm like god I miss that sometimes it's it's different here you know we don't get that here here it's just Sometimes the neighborhood is just quiet, but, you know, sometimes you want peace and quiet also, but at the same time, you want to see that because it's, it's just interesting and, and it's, yeah. it's just fun. And yeah. um, I wanted to just go back to what you guys were saying about men. And I think that that would be, yes, it would be interesting to see. And I think I would, I'd be one of those people to say that I would love to have and see that with men who can just be open and be vulnerable, you know, and just not suppressing anything. Um, my mom's side of the family in the Philippines, uh, you know, has, there's a lot of men on that side. And I know, and from what I've heard, some have, you know, you talk about drinking and that's how they take, that's how they, that's what they use to take out their emotions or whatever it is. They start drinking and they become alcoholic, right? And some who's become violent because that's how they take it out again. But that's the kind of environment that they've seen around yeah. um, because they're not given the chance to to speak up or say how they feel because men are there are viewed as, no, you're going to be a man. You're going to be working for your family. This is what you're going to do. You're going to take care of your family, your kids, whatever you need to work. Just, you know, but it, it's different with everybody. But that would be, I would love to see something like that. And not just in the Philippines, I would say. Gosh, globally, the whole world, right? Yeah, yeah. We we need a um, a uh, oh gosh, a men's rights revolution. <laughs> <laughs> For real, yeah. seriously, I would like yeah. to see that. Yeah, seriously, and and I just to pick up a point you mentioned there, Gloria, that you know we're only just role modeling what we're seeing in our environment. So until we have the resources to see other 
role models, different types of role models, then this will, it will continue itself, you know. Um, so, yeah, these, these conversations are super important, I think. It is. And, um, and you know, would like to thank you for mm -hmm. sharing your story with us and to our audience. Um, I love your story and I love what you're doing. And, you know, I'm a fan. I've already told you that from the beginning when we first talked. Um, and again, you know, I just wanted to um, congratulate you um, now with, you know, whatever it is that you have planned and the success um, that you have going on there in the Philippines. I think this is really wonderful and making a difference with everybody. And I hope to for you to continue and good for your continued success as well. Um, on that note, um, how can people find you where can they can find you and you know is there anything that you have coming up um yes so i i as i mentioned before i i do have my my eight week um mindfulness and stress management program for female entrepreneurs that's coming up um at the end of this month um but people can find me on uh, frida a sorensen.com that's my website so sorensen is spelled s-o-e R E N S E N dot com. And then you can also find me at Frida Sorensen on Facebook and IG at, um, sorry, that's Instagram at Wellness with Frida. So if anyone, just feel free to, you want to have a chat about mental health, on stress management, um, don't hesitate to, to get in touch with me. That's amazing. Look, look for all, all people out there looking for wellness, meditation, yoga. This is awesome. Best person you can contact to get the needs you need immediately and get the help you need immediately. You know, sometimes, you know, for those out there that do not want to take medication, um, they want a holistic approach to feeling better or at least find an outlet for this person that will be able to help you get that. Um, because most of us, like myself, I don't believe in a lot of medication. I believe in a holistic approach. Let me see if I can try some different ways that can support myself long term. Um, because I don't believe in, in taking a lot of medication if I can, if I don't need to. I'd rather work on something myself and, and give me the opportunity to create um, my my life. Because when I look at medication, I always think about once they give you a new pill, it may affect something else. They give you another pill that affects something else. For you know, you're taking 10 to 15 different medications and uh it's destroying your body so let's let's start healing ourselves inside out and with that being said frida thank you for being a guest on life to shovels podcast i really am humbled by your story i'm humbled by humbled by your experience and um i love listening to people's stories it's like for me it's like hearing a documentary from a live person versus watching on tv or netflix and thank you for being authentic and obviously exposing not just the Filipino culture, but the world about how mental health and meditation can be helpful for them. And for those out there that want to be a guest and share their story, you can go to www.lifes, but shuffle.com. Subscribe also on our Instagram, but go to Lives of Shuffle, send us an email and be on a guest and share your story. Because you know what? If we collectively heal the world, we can help each other out. Thanks again, Frida. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ron and Gloria, for having me. It's been such a pleasure. Yes, thank you. Um, thanks again for um, joining us today and sharing your story. And again, um, to our listeners, thank you uh, for your support and listening. And again, this is Gloria, Mindfulness Coach. And thank you for listening to another episode of Life Say Shuffle.